Tuberculosis has claimed at least 500 million lives. It is the biggest all-time killer from a single pathogen. Hello, hello, TB. Why, hello there, Professor. Well, well, there you are. Tell us about yourself. Sure, I love to talk about myself. Bacterial diseases have a long and brutal history. One of the most devastating was Black Death, or bubonic plague. The disease, transmitted by fleas, marched across Europe and Asia in the 14th century and killed a third of the population. The death rate from bubonic plague was 90%. With no medicines to fight the bacteria, doctors could do nothing to cure infectious disease. The battle continued until the 20th century, when an accidental discovery changed the course of medical history. On the return trip, the planes bring wounded back to the hospitals in Britain. Gangrene, from which millions have perished in past wars, has been conquered by the miracle of penicillin. Scientists are manufacturing... The miracle began in 1928, when a British scientist named Alexander Fleming went on vacation. He didn't bother to clean up first, just placed his bacterial cultures in the sink. When he returned, he noticed one dish had gotten moldy. The mold killed the bacteria, but Fleming couldn't stabilize or purify it. That took a four-man team from Oxford and 10 years. They named the drug after the mold. Penicillium led to penicillin. Thousands of men, thanks to penicillin and plasma, will come home to their thankful families. A whole world of peace to come will reap the benefits of this great wartime medical discovery. Science has Penicillin was the dawn of a new death. age in medicine. At last, doctors had the power to heal. It seemed man had infectious disease on the run. In the 40s, uh, when antibiotics really came into general use, there, were, there was such a, a kind of high that developed because we were taking things like, like streptococcal blood poisoning and pneumonias, gonorrhea, syphilis, and all of these things were being cured. It was really, it was a miracle. Four-year-old Elijah was a sick little boy, and his mother Vivian was worried. He wouldn't eat, he wouldn't play, he wouldn't do anything. He just lay there. He said his foot was hurting him. I asked him, did he step on something, or did he hurt his foot? And he said no. It was very unusual. And after his fever wouldn't go down, I knew it was serious. As an experienced mother of five, Vivian had never seen an illness like this. After two days of high fever, she brought Elijah to the hospital. And I didn't know what happened, and there wasn't any cuts or bruises, wasn't any uh, sign of something had happened to him. And uh, I was confused. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. Does it hurt when I go like that? Like Vivian learned Elijah's fever and pain were caused by a bacterial infection in his foot. The bacterium, called pneumococcus, usually causes ear infections, but in Elijah's case, it got in his bloodstream and lodged in the bone. The doctors prescribed antibiotics and expected Elijah to feel better in a couple of days. But five days later, Elijah's fever had not gone down. The antibiotics were not working. In the late 70s, we produced in the pharmaceutical industry uh, antibiotics active against resistant organisms in three or four different classes. In the early 80s, these products all came to the market and everybody, all physicians said, well, now we've got something active against all the resistant organisms. And the message that came back to the pharmaceutical industry from the medical community was, in fact, that they really didn't need any more uh, new antibiotics. I think that that was a certain segment of the medical community who didn't understand bacteria and understand how bacteria change and modify and adapt. This is one way bacteria adapt. A bacterium with a plasmid, plasmids hold genetic information, will connect with another bacterium. A copy of the DNA is transferred. 
The new DNA may dictate a new food or energy source or tell how to dodge an antibiotic. This sharing is passed on and on to other bacteria, even among different species, and it can happen in less than an hour. You could say that, well, if organisms really began to exchange information, then all bacteria would kind of be, be the same. They'd be in an amalgam, but they're not. Each one is kind of very individualistic uh, in terms of what they do and how they survive. And each one has a gimmick in order to survive so that it has its place, as it were, in the world. That's little comfort for Elijah and his mother as the doctors try to find out why he is not getting better. The heavy weapons of medicine are brought out to pinpoint his bone infection. Doctors collect bacteria from his foot in the operating room, then grow it in the laboratory to find out why the medicine isn't working. It's pretty much where the needle was. We'll see more when we get the pinhole views. It looks like we're on the right track. Pneumococcus is the leading bacterial cause of pneumonia, ear infections, and meningitis. Throughout the country, the number of resistant pneumococcus strains is rising and the strains are resisting more classes of antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance means that the bacteria have developed a way to avoid the killing action of antibiotics, which simply means that if you have an infection and you're given one of these antibiotics, it probably won't work for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One way to study antibiotic resistance is to go where antibiotic use is highest. In Wisconsin, nurses Priscilla Goltz and Jane Stofflet are collecting samples of, well, the material produced by runny noses. It's part of a study for the Centers for Disease Control. The rate of resistant pneumococcus in some Wisconsin daycare settings is over 40%. Okay, and I'm going to give you a bear hug, and you give Tom a bear hug, okay? Jane's just and we're gonna just going to check your nose. You a hug, and we're just going to check your nose, honey, okay? What I want you is just count to three, honey, okay? One, two, three. That's I'm all, done. sweetheart. That's I'm done. all. Oh, good, good job. girl. Good job. You did good, good, honey. Thank yeah. you. Now you got to pick out a toy. Let's go pick out a toy. <laughs> the nurses will return in a year and retest the children to monitor the trend. Oh, yes. hey. Daycare centers are often seen as one of the wonderful breeding grounds of new and novel resistant organisms. In many large daycare centers, there may be as many as 30 or 40 percent of children on an antibiotic at any given time. And so that uh, an organism uh, that is a good colonizer has a tremendous opportunity in a daycare center uh, to colonize lots of children uh, and eventually to cause disease particularly uh, if it's resistant to one or two or three antibiotics. Millions of children take antibiotics for ear infections or to prevent them. If the medicine doesn't kill all the bacteria, the infection returns and more antibiotics are prescribed. Doctors are concerned about the overuse of drugs but don't see many alternatives. Really easy for him to take and he his temperament is just so much better. He's happier. Because one of the things I want to do today, besides go through a well child checkup, is find out what we need to do for him in terms of his repeated ear infections. Right. Okay. So Great. We'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. You know, we've talked about the bacteria called the pneumococcus bacteria. That right. It's probably the most common bacterial cause of ear infections. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that's showing more signs of not responding well to antibiotics. Oh, okay. still has a lot of fluid. It's going to take a while for the fluid that's behind the drum to resorb or go away. Right. So with the way his eardrums are looking, I think we ought to put him on a preventative antibiotic. Okay. And, and we'll just do that for at least four to six weeks. Okay. When they're real uncomfortable and obviously <clears throat> bothered, right. I think it's hard to just let that go. Especially from a parent. Okay. And if he does develop a rash... Antibiotics are also widely prescribed even when they won't help. 18 million prescriptions are written each year for colds, which are caused by viruses. Very 